Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Engaging Girls in STEM 2021. This is the March speaker event with Dr. Mujige Cooper. We are so happy and excited to have her here. And uh, joining her is her colleague uh, today, who will be her uh, our facilitator, uh, Janelle Wellens. And um, throughout the today's presentation, feel free to use that chat box. Um, and uh, Janelle and I will be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, we'll go ahead and interrupt Dr. Cooper and let her know that there are some questions that she would uh, that she could potentially answer for all of you. So with that, Dr. Cooper from NASA JPL, so glad to see you here and so glad to, for you to join us. And I'm going to go ahead and let you take the show away. Awesome. Thank you so much for that fantastic introduction. Um, hi to everyone. Thank you for inviting me into your living rooms today. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to talk to you today about planetary protection. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you are going to be uh, planetary protection experts uh, and at least uh, deputy, fully deputized. Um, and, and you'll understand why we need to keep our spacecraft clean when we send it out to Mars. So before I talk about my job and what I do, I wanted to give you an idea of how I even got to where I was, because I know a lot of you out there are in elementary school. I heard there were some kindergartners out there and uh, some third graders. I know there are a few uh, middle schoolers, high schoolers, and college students, and a lot of educators out there. So hopefully this story is one of many of the examples that you've heard uh, on how someone could get a position within NASA and just in general following your dreams. So this is a picture of what my parents look like over here on the left. Uh, and my parents uh, are actually, my mom is from Korea and my dad is from Georgia uh, here in the United States. And if any of you recognize uh, my name, Mujige, if you speak Korean, Mujige actually means rainbow. Uh, so that I, I got that name thanks to my mom. So growing up, um, I grew up with my parents uh, for a few years and you know, over time with uh, changes in family structure, you know, between uh, parents divorcing and, par and my father passing away, um, eventually I made my way with my step parents to Virginia. And when I was in Virginia, I actually rented, we were able to go to the, the local library and I rented the first video in the Cosmo series. And Cosmos, if you have seen Carl Sagan's The Cosmos or Neil deGrasse Tyson's The Cosmos, uh, you would understand how cool those visuals are or were that I saw as a child. And it was that moment that I thought, aha, I want to do this for a living. This is, I want to be an astrophysicist. I want to do exactly what Carl Sagan does. And before that moment, I actually did really poorly in math and in the sciences and even in reading. Uh, and it wasn't until that moment that I thought, now I need to really pay attention and, and do my best to understand uh, what, what is being taught in school. Because before I thought, well, why do I have to understand what kind of rocks these are? And why do I have to understand um, all of these concepts? And it wasn't until I realized how everything came together uh, in the series that I thought, whoa, okay, now I know why I have to learn all of these topics. So you don't have to be born a genius per se to, you know, to work for NASA, as long as you follow your passion. So over time, I went to high school. This is myself and my sister um, playing in the marching band. Uh, went to college. During the summers, I was a co-op at NASA Langley. And during the school year, I worked at the school um, analyzing atmospheric science data. Uh, I went to graduate school. I had a NASA fellowship that paid uh, for uh, my, my way by education uh, and allowed me to get a PhD in plasma engineering. And that led to my job at NASA JPL. So I'll talk to you a little bit about what I do there specifically. So this is a, an overview of the 2020 mission. And this video that you see on the upper left-hand side, I highly encourage you, if you haven't been on the NASA uh, page, uh, mars.nasa.gov backslash Mars 2020, they have all kinds of fun tools to include an interactive uh, video or an interactive 3D map 
of the rover itself. So you can pull it, turn it around, you can click on the different parts and learn about the mobility, the helicopter, the belly pan, the, the coring drill, everything that is on the Mars 2020 rover, you can learn about it. Uh, so I highly encourage you to go to the website and check it out yourself. But the, the four main scientific goals of this mission is to first determine whether or not life ever arose on Mars. Um, that's why we have those instruments like Sherlock and Watson. Uh, and, and those instruments are focused on looking at biosignatures to see, was there ever any ancient microbial life on Mars? The second goal is to understand and characterize the climate on Mars. One of the cool things that is on the mast of the rover is a weather station. Uh, and this weather station is, uh, will allow us to tell over time uh, if there are any trends, uh, what the radiation looks like over time, uh, and, and just really understand the climate of Mars. Uh, the third goal is to look at the geology of Mars. So there are instruments that will actually allow us to understand what types of rock we're, we're looking at. And that will help too uh, to understand how we drill into them because if it's a soft rock or a hard rock that will change the way uh, we, we approach drilling it. And the last goal is to prepare for human exploration. There are instruments on here, not only the weather uh, system, but also there's a, an instrument that will change the CO2 in the atmosphere, that's mostly CO2, to oxygen. And that will help humans to have fuel to return back to earth as well as make breathable air. Something else that is being done for future human exploration, this is a calibration target of, uh, for Sherlock. And the Watson imager took a picture of this. The cool, one, there are many cool things about it, but the re, what a calibration target is, is imagine you, had a, you wanted to do a mini science project and say, I wanna know if my voice changes if I'm in California or versus if I'm on the top of Mount Everest. So your voice, you know what your voice sounds like. And then you'd hike to the top of Mount Everest and then you'd say a few set of words that you know what they sound like. And compared to what you sound like on normal land, you can make that comparison and make sure everything is calibrated and make sure that you have a baseline understanding and then to see how it changes in different different environments. That's what this calibration target is. We know the signatures of these particular pieces of, of rock. And so that'll allow us to calibrate and make sure everything is normal. Uh, and just to see if there are any things unique about looking at these calibration targets on Mars. The other cool thing is these, these square parts right here on the left side um, and the circular area here, these are all materials that, uh, that a future human astronaut spacesuit is going to be made out of. And they want to understand over time if the radiation, the UV, possibly degrades it. Uh, so we that's why they're looking at that left side to see, okay, we want to make sure that we make the safest spacesuit possible for whenever humans go on Mars. And for those who know the Easter egg, there's actually, if you realize the, the name of the instrument Sherlock and Watson, if you look really closely at this calibration target, it actually has Sherlock Holmes address uh, embedded in that calibration target or in that uh, piece of visor material. So it's a really cool target. There's so many things to be said in here. And again, I encourage you to go on the website. You can find out all of the details. And of course, as you know, the coolest part, well, I actually no, it's all pretty cool, uh, but something that we're looking forward to in the near future is the helicopter flight. So Ingenuity is the sidekick that Perseverance brought with her. Uh, and so it actually will be flying around pretty soon to demonstrate that we can fly uh, on another planet, which is a big deal. The place that we landed is called Jezero Crater. This is where Jezero Crater is when you compare it to all the other landing sites of our other landers on the and rovers on the surface of Mars. And the reason why we picked Jezero Crater is because it actually used to be an ancient lake bed. So this is what it looked like uh, about three and a half to four billion years ago. That's billion with a B, a very, very long time ago. Um, and it used to have water. And if you imagine, if you go find any lake or any river uh, nearby, and if you just scoop out a little bit of sand from the bottom of that lake or riverbed, and you put it under a microscope, 
you'll see a huge quantity and diversity of microorganisms in that sample. And that's why we want to target a place like an ancient lake bed. The ancient lake beds we know have the most a highest probability of allowing us to find um, some sort of um, uh, fossilized material. So this is why we're targeting this area. This is what it looks like today. Um, you can see this delta here is where the water and the sediments carried in to the, that ancient lake bed. So that's gonna have a lot of really interesting uh, possible ancient biosignatures, we hope. So the goal is to collect, we actually brought with us 43 tubes and five witness tubes. The witness tubes job is to make sure that uh, there aren't any weird uh, or, or things in the sample that didn't come from Mars. Uh, that is our, what we call a negative control. It didn't really get collect anything, but it's something for us to compare it with that went through all the environments just to make sure that what we see is a true signal. We got a question for you yeah. already. This is from Shriti Hazra. What tools did you use to recreate this picture from billions of years ago on Mars? Oh, that's a really great question. So this is an artist's concept and the, and the tools that they use, and this is the beautiful part about STEAM, not just STEM, but the arts part. We heavily rely on artists to help make our um, dreams, in, in a sense, the scientific uh, evidence come true into some visual product. And so what we see today is this, and based on a lot of really smart geologists uh, from, uh, from around the United States and around the world, they have seen different lake beds here on Earth. And based on what it looks like, and based on the features that they see on Mars, they were able to recreate what they thought uh, the ancient Mars uh, lake looked like. That's a great question though. We've also got another question from Winona. She's got a two-parter for you. Ooh. When are they planning on testing the flight of the drone and how are they going to deal with the time delay? Oh, girl, yeah, the, the time delay is a big deal. So they hope to test the flight of the drone. I actually have a picture later on in the slide that shows just a little bit of a, a flight, not the, a notional flight pattern, um, but they hope to test it in the next few days. They're still making their way uh, and driving to the next site, the site that they're going to deploy uh, or release the helicopter. So that should be in the next few days. Uh, and definitely check out the, the NASA website because they have all the updates there for all of the uh, rover operators and the helicopter operators are giving the, the world updates on the website. Uh, but yeah, hopefully in a few days, we'll be able to deploy it. And then uh, it will have several flight patterns um, the big, most important and first step is to see if it can go up and down, which is a huge deal. It may sound simple, but it actually is really difficult uh, to fly a helicopter even up and down in on Mars. There are other questions, but we're going to let you uh, sure. okay. go on first. Sounds good. Yep. Interrupt at any time. <laughs> All right, so yeah, we hope to collect these samples and then eventually we hope to return at least 20 of them to Earth. And as we're collecting these samples, the goal is to drop these samples on the surface of Mars as you're collecting them, um, as you get a, a significant amount together, then you get to drop them off. And the reason that we are doing that is because scientists were afraid and that if something ever happened to the rover during the mission, that we might not be able to retrieve these samples. So they thought the best thing to do is drop them off in, in clusters on the surface of Mars so that we can retrieve it with a future uh, retrieval lander. And then the biggest thing I heard your theme was uh, collaboration. And one big thing that we need to succeed as a group of scientists is help and collaboration from our partners, not only at NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, not only around the United States with a lot of our great partners there, but around the world. We're actually working with the European Space Agency to help bring these samples back. And it's gonna be a whole series of missions, uh, not only Mars 2020, which is what you see there on the left side of your screen, uh, but they're also going to send a rover, a, a landing rover that will retrieve these samples. That's what these little cartoon tubes are here. 
Um, the, this is a fetch rover that's going to collect the tubes, bring them to a rocket that's going to launch it into orbit, and there'll be an orbiter there to catch it and send it back to Earth. So collaboration and, and unity is a big theme, even in space exploration. So now I'll transition into what I do. Is there any, are there any questions before I transition into what planetary protection is? Sure, there's actually a few questions. Sure. Um, one of them has to do with uh, uh, the water. Um, and there's, a few, there's a few questions about water. Sure. Uh, one of them is, uh, is the water hot and how deep is it? Yeah, so the water in, that I showed in the picture here, um, that water does not exist today. Um, that's just an artist's picture. Sorry, I should have been a little bit more clear about that. This is what it looked like three and a half to four billion years ago. And so it does not look like that anymore. It just looks like this. So it's not, um, there is still liquid that we think is trapped in the soil. There might be liquid deeper uh, under the surface of Mars. But uh, right now, this is what you see here is about what it looks like. I mean, this is just kind of a, a different image with different colors, but it essentially looks like this with no visible water. And then as far as the uh, tubes, um, how big are they and how much can they actually carry? That's a great question. I have a prop right here <laughs> off camera. Um, so these, two, this is a 3D printed uh, sample tube assembly. So each tube has its own um, sheath to keep it protected. And it has a glove to allow the, the arm, there's a little robotic arm in the bottom of the rover that moves the tubes from station to station. And this little, um, this little glove is what we call it, uh, keeps these tubes clean. So the tubes are about this tall, right? <laughs> Just to give you a sense of scale. Uh, the, the actual sample that goes inside is about the size of a piece of chalk. Um, so it's about a centimeter in diameter and about 10 centimeters long. Uh, and yeah, the, these are, this is the exact size of what the tubes are going to be that, the, that will fall on the surface of Mars. The last question for you is, um, how, how big do, uh, do scientists think the lake could have been? Oh, that's a really good question. I, I don't know the exact answer to that. I will have to defer you to, maybe I'll follow up with you or, um, yeah, if you, a, a quick Google search, but <laughs> I don't know exactly how big it is, but it is quite large. It's a, a very large lake. Um, and still, even, even the landing zone that we landed in, uh, was only a small fraction of the size of this ancient lake. Um, so it's many, many uh, hundreds of kilometers wide. You're good to awesome. go. Great. All right. So now let me talk about what I do specifically. Um, so because there are thousands of people who have worked on this mission. And my job specifically was planetary protection. And planetary protection has two different flavors. There's the outbound planetary protection. So when we send our spacecraft to Mars, we have to make sure that before it even leaves, uh, it's really microbially clean. So all the microorganisms that you find here on Earth, we try to limit it to a very, very small amount so that it doesn't contaminate Mars. And then the second flavor of planetary protection is on the return side for back contamination. So when we bring these samples back, we have to make sure that the spacecraft, these samples don't carry some weird unknown life from Mars that may harm humans. So there's two parts to it. And the main thing that I'm focusing on for this particular 2020 mission is the outbound contamination and making sure we keep Mars clean. So how do we do that? Um, it's done through many, many different ways. I'm highlighting just a few here on your screen. Uh, on the upper left-hand corner, you can see, or on the left side here, you can see all the ways we clean. So on the upper left-hand side, we wipe the spacecraft down with IPA, uh, isopropyl alcohol. Uh, as you know, many of you are, have, uh, actually everyone has gone through the, the global pandemic that's happening right now. And a lot of the CDC guidelines that were recommended to the public is something that we actually use every day. For example, uh, when you wipe down the spacecraft, we have to use 70% isopropyl, isopropyl alcohol. 
And 70% we found was the most optimum. So the, the CDC guidelines that they gave you are really spot on. And they're so great that that's the exact same thing that we do for spacecraft. So we wipe the surfaces because if you imagine, if you look in your room that look around you where you're sitting, sometimes dust settles and collects and in that dust are different microbes. So that's why we wanna wipe it down even as things sit in our clean room. Uh, on the lower side here, this is a picture of a, a chamber that these, so the little tubes that you see here, that is one of, each one is one of these 3D printed, this is an actual real, not 3D printed, uh, tube assemblies. Um, and so these assemblies uh, are all assembled here on that on this part of your screen here. There's tubes, there's a volume assessment probe, uh, there's also a, several uh, dispensers, seal dispensers, um, but it's kind of like a PEZ dispenser that puts the seal on top of the tube so that we can seal the sample inside of it. And so this whole assembly was put together in a chamber and exposed to a really high bakeout, a high temperature bakeout, 302 degrees Fahrenheit for 29 hours. And so there, that is one way that we also clean the hardware uh, is a high temperature bakeout. And then another thing that we do is the, at least for the critical samples, like every single piece of hardware that's going to touch the Martian soil had to, um, had to go through this process that you see in the upper or the lower left-hand corner, but also the tools that we use to touch these really clean pieces of spacecraft, all of those tools were precision cleaned and autoclaved or sterilized. So that word autoclave probably sounds really familiar to you because when you go to the doctor's office or you go to the dentist, when they take out your tools, they, you usually see them probably peeling open a bag and that's an autoclave pouch. So everything that goes in your mouth and on your body has to go through, um, several, there are several processes that they can use to clean it, but most of them go through this autoclaving process. So that is a that will allow those tools to be sterilized. And so once we have this clean spacecraft, we also have to make sure that we take samples. You can, you can trust, but verify. So we take samples uh, everywhere on the entire spacecraft this is a picture of me taking a sample right before the ejectable belly pan was put on the bottom of the rover for the very last time before launch. And finally, as you saw uh, last week, it was deployed. Uh, but this was the very last time that we actually saw all of that hardware before it left, uh, left our planet. And so here we're taking a swab and then we're trying to see how clean those surfaces are. And one thing that you'll notice in these pictures that there's these, there are these garments here. We call them bunny suits because most times it's white, just like on the left side of the screen. Uh, and you look like bunnies with no ears. So we call them bunny suits. And the reason why we wear them is because one of the biggest sources of contamination in the clean room are humans. So humans have more microbes on and in our body than we have human cells. And the thing is that doesn't mean we're dirty, uh, we, we actually need all of those microbes in our gut, for example, to help us digest food and on our skin to help regulate all those processes. But we don't want to put them on the spacecraft because we don't want them to hitch a ride and possibly contaminate the environments we're exploring. So that's why we make sure the spacecraft itself is protected from us as the biggest source of contamination. Check in for questions. Any questions before I move on? Uh, one question is, uh, how big is the ship? The ship? I wonder if you are talking about the, the fairing that delivers the, the spacecraft, which it's a five meter fairing. Um, I actually have a picture of it ahead. This is what it looks like. Is Hopefully this is what you mean by the ship. This is the part that encapsulated the whole spacecraft. The spacecraft is buried uh, a layer deep in here. Uh, and it's huge. If you were a person, and I, yeah, there's no person in this particular picture, but if you were a person, you'd be about the size of my mouse. If you see my mouse on the screen, you'd be about that tall. So that can give you a, a little bit of an idea of how big the vessel was that at least ferried it into, uh, into space. These broke apart, uh, and then the rest of the spacecraft stayed with it. 
uh, all the way to the end. So this kind of gives you a sense of scale. My, my mouse is about a person, so you can see how large everything is. And then the last question is, um, uh, where exactly is the uh, chamber? And I'm not sure if it's uh, the vacuum chamber or if it's a testing chamber. Yeah, I wonder if it's this chamber that I was referring to here. So this chamber uh, was in the clean room. It was actually built, custom built. Uh, so that because this chamber itself went into the oven, uh, it served as an oven, but it also served as a transportation chamber so that once we are done cleaning it, it doesn't get exposed to anything else until we load it into the belly of the rover. Um, so this chamber was in the clean room where we assembled all of the space, these particular uh, pieces of the, the spacecraft. And then it traveled to Cape Canaveral to Florida so that we can add it to the belly of the rover. Actually, you see right here, this picture was taken just days after we put all of these parts in there. So what you see here on this bottom left-hand side of your screen is actually this part here on the upper right-hand side of your screen, the exact same thing uh, after it was integrated. Uh, so yeah, and so it stayed with us in Florida for a few weeks and then it was shipped back to Southern California. So I'm sure it's somewhere on uh, on lab, <laughs> uh, just being proud of itself for the great job that it did. <laughs> All right. Um, so to talk a little bit more about what I do every day. Um, so we take the samples like you saw on the last screen. We take the samples and we grow them up and we identify everything that we find. You can imagine we don't find a lot on the spacecraft because it's so clean. But when we do find something, it's always really interesting because that means it's something that could have survived all of the cleaning. The uh, There's no nutrients in the clean room. It's uh, very uh, relatively dry. I mean, it's not so dry where we have electrostatic discharge like a lightning bolts, like static electricity. Um, but it's there's not a lot of nutrients for microbes to grow. So when we do find something, they're usually quite special. So we, we identify them and we save them in a freezer. Uh, we have these kind of microbes all the way back to till um, since the Viking mission, which is the first time planetary protection was actually used. So we do that. Um, and it takes about seven days to do this growing and identifying. But we also get a, a separate set of samples and we take it and we extract DNA. Uh, I'm sure everyone out there has heard of uh, the company 23andMe where if you want to know, oh, uh, you know, what is my heritage? You take a mouth swab and you send in your sample and they sequence your DNA and they tell, give you an idea of where you came from. And the same thing happens with the samples on the spacecraft. We take a sample and we extract the DNA and we save some for the future because there might be technology in the future that might do a better job detecting small amounts of DNA. But we also take it and we identify it, similar to uh, when you send in your cheek swab to, to see where you came from. Uh, and so we do that and we're able to identify everything that exists, not just the things that will grow on petri dishes. And that allows us to have a full list of possible passengers that could make its way to Mars. And that's a pretty quick turnaround time to do that, much faster than growing it and isolating it and identifying it. So in total, we took over the lifetime of the, the mission. So I remember the, taking the very first samples in 2014, uh, we took a sample of the descent stage. And from 2014 all the way until July of 2020, we took 13,042 swabs. We took 3,521 wipes. 318 air samples. So you can imagine even as I'm talking, if I were to collect all the air in front of me when I'm talking, all of the microbes in my mouth, you could probably detect them on the Petri dish. So it's important to collect air samples too, because sometimes the tinier particles stay airborne for quite a long time and may travel farther than some of the heavier particles that settle on the surface already. So we took a bunch of air samples, 318 to be specific, uh, and we took 1,122 genetic inventory samples. So the, the, the DNA sequencing part that I talked about, we have about 1,100 or exactly 1,122 samples that we sequenced for DNA. 
And when we look at all of that information, we show that um, if you recall in the beginning, I said we have a, a limit, a cap on the amount of microbes we can send to Mars, just understanding how clean a surface is and how many microbes die along the way. Uh, we we actually showed that we were way cleaner than what the requirement was for our spacecraft cleanliness. And um, yeah, we, we did a, a pretty great job. We had an 87% margin. What that means is we could have been 87% more dirty and still have been clean enough to launch. Uh, so, and that that's actually pretty cool. And that's for all of the things that landed on the surface of Mars. If you add everything up, not just what landed, but um, for example, these pieces of fairing that went around the spacecraft, we had to make sure that that was clean too, uh, because it could transfer its contaminants from the fairing surface to the spacecraft. So when you add all of that, everything up together, we had a 25% margin. So we, we ate up 75% of how dirty we could be, and we still had 25% more to go. Um, and so that was actually pretty good for a rover and a, an entire spacecraft this size. And this is a quick video. So now you know we launched, we landed, and this is a, a computer generated recreation of the rover's first drive, like baby's first steps. This is our baby's first steps. So this, you can see it's driving forward here. It did a little spin. And now it's going to back up a little bit and just make sure that everything is checked out, everything works. And it's funny because if you take this uh, recreation and you map it on top of one of the early photos, here you can see with the tracks that it drove in, it did a spin and it backed up. So it's really cool to see the videos and map it on top of the photos that you that you find online. So all of this is on mars.nasa.gov backslash mars2020. If you look at the multimedia, you can find all these pictures and, and thousands of more, uh, more pictures. Um, so yeah, this, this picture exactly shows the same pattern as that first video. So a few things to look forward to, um, as you saw a few days ago, the helicopter finally deployed the debris shield. And the purpose for the debris shield is if you saw videos of entry, descent, and landing, as we get close to the surface of Mars, the jets that are on the descent stage, that rocket jet pack, those jets uh, blow up a lot of dirt and debris. And one thing that we saw for the Curiosity rover is when that dirt and debris circulated, some of those rocks actually hit one of the instruments and it wasn't able to work. So we learned that lesson and a lot of things were fixed and changed on that uh, one sensor. And that actually does work this time around. But also they added this uh, because the helicopter wasn't didn't exist for the last mission, but they knew the rocks get kicked up. So we, we really need to make sure we protect the helicopter so that even before we get to the surface of Mars, we wanna make sure it doesn't get uh, broken. So that was finally deployed and you can see, this is the, the rover all scrunched up. It's going to flip upside down soon. Uh, once they deploy it, once they get to the site, they're gonna flip it down and then the legs are gonna pop out and it's gonna land on the legs. And then the rover will drive away, do a lot of inspections at every step of the, of the way and have our first flight. So this is just a, a notional, again, the artist's picture of uh, bringing to life what we hope to do uh, of where the rover is back here. So there, there's only one main requirement of the helicopter and that was to do no harm to the rover. So the, this, is, this experiment in a sense uh, is, is, the, is just that. It's an experiment to see, can we fly on the surface of Mars and collect really cool videos? But the main thing that it really needs to not do is make sure it doesn't fly and crash into the rover and affect the rover's primary objectives. So it's good. That's why the rover is all the way back there in, in, the, in the horizon here. It still needs to be close enough to communicate to, uh, with the helicopter, but that's why it's the artist shows it as far, a little bit farther away. So 
It's going to do a series of flights. Um, you know, it has to make sure it can take out and go up and down. Um, and yeah, it's going to have a series of flights where it'll take images and really understand of whether or not we can fly and control a helicopter. And the way that planetary protection fits into this helicopter mission is we actually were involved all the way in the early stages to make sure it was assembled in a clean way, because now this is a thing that takes off of the ground and could possibly crash and break open. And we don't want any microbes inside to spread on the surface of Mars. And we are fortunate the helicopter was just extremely clean. Uh, the, the team that built this did such a fantastic job to include, I don't know if you heard the news, uh, but it was recently finally announced that the a piece of the, the um, Wright brothers plane when they did their historic flight uh, was actually added to this helicopter. So it's going to make history yet again. And the way planetary protection fits in is we had to actually take that and put it in an autoclave, that same thing that I showed you a picture of a few slides ago, and sterilize it. Then that way we it doesn't have any contaminants that it would spread onto the surface of Mars. So we were planetary protection was involved for every single piece that you see uh, that flew the, the rover there and landed it there, and as well as the helicopter to make sure it was all clean enough. And this is what the ultimate, my, my ultimate favorite part of this mission is once we're done with a lot of those flights, we're going to move on to the sampling and uh, collection and caching. So here's just a, another video that an artist helped us create to show how that's going to happen. And when we take a sample, the sample goes directly into the tube. The tube goes in the carousel and that carousel is rotated so that that small arm that I was talking to you about that will manipulate the tube from station to station, that arm can take it and move it to all of our different stations to look at it. Right now it's putting it in, uh, in one of our camera stations so that it can look and see how large the sample is um, and, and just make sure that with each step of sealing the tube that it's done in the proper way. Uh, and then we also have another station called the volume assessment station that will also measure how much volume uh, that sample takes. And once it's sealed and done, we put it back in that location that it showed um, the, the tube assembly uh, area until we're ready to drop off those samples on the surface of Mars. So these are a few things that you can look forward to, the helicopter flight, the sampling, the sealing, and tube drop off, and then eventually returning the samples to Earth. So as you think about this mission and as you hear all of this great news, uh, just keep in mind that planetary protection is a really big part of it to make sure we not only do the right thing because it's the, the right thing to do when we explore the planets is to make sure we don't contaminate it, but also it allows us to do great science and discover possible ancient life forms, ancient microbial life forms on Mars confidently. So when you look at this mission and other missions, just know that we need to be good custodians of our universe and explore responsibly. Thank you so much for your time. That is the end of my presentation. Wow. Dr. Mujige, that was incredible. <laughs> I, <laughs> I work with you. Oh, I should put on my, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, who is this floating voice? <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Janelle. I work with Dr. Mujige and she is a phenomenal engineer, but also a very fantastic person as well. So first, I just want to thank you for giving this presentation to everyone here today. You have a lot of questions, a lot of really great questions. And so I'm going to slowly work my way through, maybe switching between some technical questions and personal ones, because you got a bit of both. Yeah. All right, so let's see if I miss anything. Let's start with a personal question since we just ended with the technical bits. So people are wondering, where did you go to school? What did you study? And maybe even a little bit about how did you go from there to NASA? Yeah, uh, so I went to, for my undergraduate degree, I went to Hampton University. It's an HBCU in Hampton, Virginia. 
Um, and I, I thankfully, with the location, the geographic location, I was able to work during the school year uh, on analyzing atmospheric science data. And during the summer, I was able to uh, be a co-op, a co-op student uh, at NASA Langley because it's, it's right down the street. So yeah, thanks to the, the proximity to NASA, that really got me in what we call the NASA pipeline. So once you get in, you, there's no escaping <laughs> uh, in a good way, right? Um, so that carried through between internships, uh, fellowships to get my PhD at Drexel University. Um, then at, with that, that led to my postdoc at NASA JPL. And then with that, I became hired as a, a full-time employee. So that's kind of my journey. Yeah. That's great. And I always get excited when you mention Drexel University, because I grew up in New Jersey and I have oh, friends yeah. who went there. <laughs> There's a little connection. Yeah. Okay, so I kind of want to take us back from the very beginning when you were showing us those incredible images of Watson and Sherlock. You had mentioned that there was this fun Easter egg and the address for Sherlock was included in the calibration target. I was just wondering, are there any other Easter eggs on this mission? And does JPL have a history of making Easter eggs like this? Yeah, JPL definitely has a history of Easter eggs. I mean, you, why, why not do great things and make history and add a little sprinkle your own signature into uh, what you're designing and what you're building? Uh, I, I know you probably have already seen the Easter egg in the parachute. Uh, which says in binary, dare mighty things, and it has the latitude and longitude of Jet, Jet Propulsion Lab. Our coordinates are embedded in the parachute itself. Um, there are other Easter eggs, but I'm not allowed to break that news. <laughs> but just know, keep it, all of you detectives out there, keep your eye out. There are more things to discover. I love that, and I can't wait to see it myself. <laughs> So here is another question. People were very curious about the tie-in to sending this rover to Mars and people eventually getting there one day, astronauts. Do you have any thoughts or could you share any information about human travel to Mars? Yeah, uh, that's the really interesting thing about that I find about the Artemis program. So Artemis, if you haven't heard, uh, is a program that's going to be happening on the moon where it's it's kind of like a test bed. Imagine if you had to uh, ride a bike for 10 miles. Well, you probably want to ride a bike maybe around the block, around the corner, see see what you can, what logistics you need. Do I need to bring one bottle of water or two bottles of water? And how do I prepare? So in order to get humans to Mars, yeah, you can pack humans in and, and send them straight to Mars, but there's so much that you have to learn beforehand, and it's nice to be at a relatively closer distance uh, on the moon so that if something happens to possibly go wrong, you're not that far away from resources and, and from coming back home. So that's why I think our, a program like Artemis is so important so that we can really iron that out. Um, we, there's, there's still a lot more to understand about humans and how we would react to, to the travel, to the journey to Mars. So there's a lot to be understood. Absolutely. And uh, it's funny you bring up Artemis because another thing about Dr. Mujige that you all may not know is that the way that we work together at JPL is actually through one of JPL's employee resource groups, the Black Excellence Strategic Team. And we recently had a guest speak at JPL. And would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it was astronaut Stephanie Wilson, who we know is going to be one of the Artemis astronauts, which is so exciting. Um, Janelle is so humble because she didn't mention that she is the president of this group, that she's on this employee research group, and she does a phenomenal job leading the charge. Um, but yeah, so, so astronaut Wilson was able to speak to the group, um, to speak to all of JPL, all of NASA actually, and talk about this Artemis mission and what she's looking forward to and, and all of the great challenges ahead. Um, but what I really enjoyed is after the, the main talk, we, she was able to also talk to uh, the group in BEST, this Black Excellence Strategic Team, uh, just to really level about the specific challenges 
uh, of being someone that looks like her um, going through this process. So that's why I love doing things like this because yes, that it's really tough to break into, well, not that well, it's tough, but it's challenging, right? You have to persist to be uh, an engineer or a scientist, but there are some unique challenges depending on your background. So it's nice to kind of have someone that could relate to you and give you some advice to help you navigate through those specific challenges. You're so right. You are so right. <laughs> she was so inspiring. She I keep out. <laughs> she is awesome. So we have a question about your specialty, your expertise, planetary protection. So we talked about how you clean things on the ground. You check the, the contamination rates before letting it get launched into space. But this question was about, do we worry about the contamination after actually leaving Earth? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, so we do uh, worry about the contamination, but we have models so that we don't worry. As soon as we send it out, we already know based on the calculations how what the contamination is going to go through in those environments, how many are, are going to die. And so by the time we launch, we actually don't worry about it in the sense that we already know what's going to happen. <laughs> so and, and the nice thing is once we get to Mars, there were, were models that were run early way in advance that shows that there's really a low likelihood, especially based on the way we designed the hardware, that any earth microbes could transfer into the Mars uh, sample. But that's why you know, we trust but verify we have those blank samples just to compare and make sure we did the right job and we had the right assumptions. Makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so we had a question. Oh, this was a great one. So as someone who also works in this space, things can go wrong, right? You, you make a plan, you design for things to work, but things can go wrong. So the question was, what do you do in case the rover breaks? That's, yeah, that's a great question. And, and just like Janelle was saying, Things do go, things always go wrong. <laughs> and and, and the, even if you design it well, there might be some anomalies that pop up. So if, for example, the rover breaks, depending on how it breaks, uh, there are pe a group of people that will come together and make a plan to see how we address it. For example, uh, on the, if we so far we're doing pretty well for the Perseverance rover, but for InSight, that lander, uh, if you remember, there was the, a mole that was supposed to dig down uh, it, through the surface of Mars. And they realized that as the mole started digging, it got hung up on something. So they actually made a test bed here on Earth. They recreated the whole environment they had a duplicate mole and they tested out, okay, what are these different things that we can do? Maybe we can pack the dirt around the mole so that it has something to catch on to. So they tried it in the test bed, seemed to work all right. They tried it uh, on, on Mars and it, it started off really well. And then it started to pop back out again. So it's like, okay, what else can we do? So they tested it again in the test bed. Okay, let's shove the, the scoop nearby and help it brace itself on it. And they tried it, seemed to do all right tried it on Mars. So they do kind of a process like that where they figure out on our test bed here, they don't just go and do it. They just want to test it out on our test bed on earth to make sure we don't make anything worse. <laughs> um, so yeah, that would be kind of some of the, uh, the general process that we would go through. Yes, and I can relate to this a lot because my job at JPL is operating the instruments that we put on our spacecraft and rovers and things. And so I love it when we have a good game plan ahead of time for dealing with the unforeseen accidents that can happen. Uh, so the next question that I have for you, oh, this is nice. So how long was the process from building this rover, the instruments, testing it, cleaning it, launching it? How long does something like a Mars 2020 actually take? Yeah, that's a fantastic question because a lot of times we get caught up in the excitement and the instant gratification. And this whole mission took about nine years. <laughs> <laughs> from, from concept to what you see today is about nine years. And so, and I, like I mentioned earlier in the talk, my, the first sample that we took, so you had to have something built up. The first samples that we took were in 2014. It was, I think, November, 2014. 
So we, a lot of building has been happening, building, testing, meetings, redesigns uh, have been happening for years and years and years. And, and myself, I've spent about eight years uh, on that mission. So it's pretty incredible. We had uh, someone in the audience say, wow, that's about all my life. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. Wow. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. Yes. So this other question that we got is about how long it takes to actually communicate with the stuff that we have out on Mars. Mars is pretty far away. And they have read that it takes 11 minutes for a message to travel from Mars to Earth. Can you talk about that and maybe why that is? Yeah, that's a really great question. And, and the 11 minute delay is because based on the distance between where the earth is and where Mars is, it takes time, even traveling at the speed of light, you know, it takes some time to go send the signal from the earth to the actual instrument, and then have it say, yep, I gotcha and send it back. And it's actually for that reason that we couldn't live joystick the, the spacecraft onto the surface of Mars. Because as you may have seen with the seven minutes of terror video, uh, we, we would know if it's alive or dead. <laughs> um, we, we wouldn't know immediately if we were successful. So you don't want to like imagine you have a, a race car and imagine that there's a, a 11 minute delay between when you hit go forward and it actually moves forward. It's gonna be really tough to navigate through all of the obstacles. So that's why a lot, of, before we even left, a group of great programmers uh, put together a, a several sets of code to allow it to know what to do uh, autonomously. Uh, we it essentially had a set of maps to compare to what it saw on the ground, line it up, and then find the closest safe place to land. So because of that delay, there were a lot of things that we can't do live. So that's a really, really great question. <laughs> That's, I think that's what made it scary for me. <laughs> Everyone at JPL was watching this happen, but in all honesty, there is nothing that we could do at that point, right? Exactly. <laughs> so I have a kind of like a two-parter for you. One is, the question was, what is the temperature on Mars? But I think we could tie this into the mission too. Are we learning something new about Mars that could be useful to understanding how humans can survive there if they went one day? And then on the other side of things is what's happening here on Earth, the pandemic, useful for understanding how humans could potentially live on Mars one day? Got it. Yeah, so the, the average temperature, according to Mars Odyssey here <laughs> on Earth, uh, or sorry, on Mars, is about negative 81 degrees Fahrenheit. It is extremely cold, yes. And so uh, some of the things that we can learn, uh, especially in that weather station that's on the mast of the rover, you know, where if you imagine the head is the, the head part where the laser is, on the neck part, there's the, the weather sensor, weather station there. And that all of those devices are going to tell us a lot of new things about how much radiation we're going to feel if humans go there, what the temperature is, the winds of uh, direction and, and magnitude. And that'll allow us to make spacesuits that will protect us from those very chilly, <laughs> very, very chilly temperatures um, and allow us to not necessarily thrive, but survive on the surface of Mars. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so it'll teach us a lot of new things. And in particular, um, on that Cal target that I showed you, um, all of those pieces of spacecraft or uh, astronaut suit material, depending on how that degrades or not, that'll allow us to design those spacesuits in the future much better uh, and in a way that'll protect the future humans. I love how you said survive, but maybe not thrive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. And then uh, maybe you can touch on the pandemic bit. Uh, is there anything that we're, because, you know, going out to Mars, some people are very excited about it. For me, I'm like, would I actually be happy living with maybe five other people and <laughs> can't really just go home when you want? Do you think that the pandemic is in a way training perhaps the future inhabitants of Mars? 
Wow, that that's a really interesting um, perspective of, of how to view this. Yeah, I mean, there's there are different private companies that send people out into the desert and like four or five people to live uh, in a hub to see what it would look like or what you know what they could expect if you are on a habitat on Mars. And yeah, I think we're all kind of getting a taste of that for this pandemic. I think that's a fantastic point in observation. Uh, and and the, the the longing for human contact and you know being able to hug your family members when you want, it, you could definitely get a, a feeling of of how you might miss that if you do choose to be one of the the first humans to go to Mars. And I think it's going to be a big deal. You'll you'll forever be in the history books. Um, but yeah, it's a big sacrifice to 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 make that choice. I'm trying to think of a positive way to spin it, but yeah, it's, it is what it is. <laughs> I, I think you're right. I, I definitely think you're right. I mean, whenever I uh, talk to my mom about maybe one day I'll apply to be an astronaut, she's like, you're not going to space. <laughs> you're far away from your family and friends. So I just say, I'll just go. And once I get there, then I'll tell them that way they can't do anything about it. <laughs> and the thing is, there are so many advances in technology that will happen where the journey might be shorter. We may not have to go for so long. They'll and you know maybe they'll figure out how to shield humans from the amount of radiation that we'll be experiencing on that journey. So I hope it's going to be faster and easier and more uh, approachable for the future. But I, I'm with you. I think I, I'd want to go as far as the moon, maybe low Earth orbit. That's about it. <laughs> With the current state of technology, that's where I'm at. <laughs> that's fair enough. <laughs> Definitely fair enough. Let some other people test it out first, you know. Yeah. So we're coming to the to end of the hour. I did want to round it out with one last question. I know there were a lot of questions for you, uh, Dr. Mujige. I mean, you you have, I believe, really inspired a lot of the students here, the people here. Uh, your work is incredible, and it's amazing that we get to talk to a real-life Mars 2020 planetary protection <laughs> person, the lead. And so, final question, is your mom proud of you? Oh. <laughs> She is proud of me. She is. I love talking to her. She, I, I make sure to give her updates on what's going on. Um, and she updates all of my, my family, at least the family in Korea. Um, but yeah, yeah. She's very proud. Thank you for asking. <laughs> everybody can relate to that because everybody's moms and dads want to be proud of them. Of course, of course. Yeah. So I'm going to hand it over to Julie Newman to close us out. And I would like to thank you so much for answering all of these questions. I feel like my brain grew three times larger today. <laughs> oh, you're too kind. Oh, Anthony, you taking it? Okay. Um, so uh, thank you again, Dr. Mujige. This was fabulous. Absolutely loved it. Um, I just wanted to come on quickly and do a plug for our upcoming event next week. Um, next Tuesday night, we will be doing a panel of ambassadors. Um, and we'd like you to follow us on Instagram if uh, you want to get updates. And also we have a new website which we are posting all of the uh, events on and all the details. That was, I, I believe, where most of you signed up for this event. So hopefully you know where that is. But also, again, please follow us on Instagram. We've been putting extra content on there. And please uh, pass it on to anyone else you know to hopefully, uh, so that hopefully we can have just as healthy of an audience for all of our future events too. So. That's it. Our, our Instagram handle is Engaging Girls in STEM. Uh, the website is www.uh, 